Welcome everyone to Mount Calvary Lutheran Church on this last Sunday of October. And it's also Reformation Sunday, a Sunday where we celebrate we're saved by faith in Christ alone. Today we're looking at the second half of John chapter 10, Jesus' speak about being the good shepherd. And we hope this day that you will understand that you have a good shepherd who willingly laid down his life for you. Let us pray. Lord God, be with us now as we worship you. Help us to see you as our good shepherd. Amen. Consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God be mercifully a sinner. We take a moment of silent confession. 
Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Hear now the good news from your good shepherd. Almighty God in his mercy has given a son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore announce the forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As part of a flock who lives in forgiveness, we encourage you now to greet with the peace of the Lord the other sheep of the Good Shepherd, either in person or online.
Profound Quotes by me, Martin Luther. 1. Good works have always been valued more highly than faith. Of course, it's true. We should do good works and respect the importance of them. But we should be careful that we don't elevate good works to such an extent that faith and Christ become secondary. If we esteem them too highly, good works can become the greatest idolatry. Two, we must make a great difference between God's word and the word of man. A man's word is a little sound that flies into the air and soon vanishes. But the word of God is greater than heaven and earth, yea, greater than death and hell, for it forms part of the power of God and endures everlastingly. Three. God writes the gospel not in the Bible alone, but on trees and flowers and clouds and stars. Four, a person who does not regard music as a marvelous creation of God must be a clodhopper indeed. He should be permitted to hear nothing but the braying of asses and the grunting of hogs. Five, even if I knew that tomorrow the world would go to pieces, I would still plant my apple tree. Six, so when the devil throws your sins in your face and declares that you deserve death and hell, tell him this. I admit that I deserve death and hell. What of it? For I know one who suffered and made satisfaction on my behalf. His name is Jesus Christ, Son of God, and where he is, there I shall be also. Seven, I have held many things in my hands and I have lost them all. But whatever I have placed in God's hands, that I still possess. Eight, the Bible is a remarkable fountain. The more one draws and drinks of it, the more it stimulates thirst. Nine, he who is well acquainted with the text of scripture is a distinguished theologian. For a Bible passage or text is of more value than the comments of four authors. Lastly, 10. The dog is the most faithful of animals and would be much esteemed were it not so common. Our Lord God has made his greatest gifts the commonest. Our Bible reading for this day is taken from John chapter 10, starting with verse 11. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. And so when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. And the reason my Father loves me is I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. 
This I received from my father. At these words, the Jews again were divided. Many of them said, he's demon possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? This is the gospel of our Lord. We now together with our fellow Christians confess our common faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. What do we believe in? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From that she will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on this Reformation Sunday. Well, today we continue our sermon series on the Gospel of John. We're in John chapter 10. Last week we looked at the bad shepherds, and this week we'll be looking at the good shepherd who loves us. And uh, some more interesting facts about sheep because you are God's little lamb. Uh, first thing is sheep do not make good pets. They will form a bond with you, but they will literally go crazy if they're not part of a herd of sheep. So if you want a sheep for a pet, you need to have six, seven, eight, or nine of them at a time. Next fun fact, a sheep are immune to most snake venom, something strange in their blood. And then third, sheep have an intricate social hierarchy consistent of dominant and non-dominant male and female sheep and they work in this community uh, as they go about their business. Anyway, we're talking about sheep once again because Jesus said this, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. You are the sheep. He is the good shepherd. And the big idea for today is this, we need a good shepherd Jesus to lead us through the wilderness of this world. We need a good shepherd because we are sheep. So let's get into our text and to really understand this text, you have to understand where the sheep hung out as Jesus talked about this text. When Jesus says, I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep and then talking about hired hands and wolves, Everybody there understood something about sheep, that the sheep lived in dangerous places in Israel. In Israel, sheep lived in the deserts on the fringes of all the major towns of the nation. Uh, Israel has this central coastal mountains and to the right of the mountains is desert. Just about 45 minute walk from Jerusalem, you are in the desert. And in the desert, water was scarce, food was scarce, and dangers were everywhere. And this is where the sheep were kept. Uh, in this text, Jesus talks about wolves. Wolves lived in those desert areas. Uh, this is from September 19, 2017. There have been 10 attacks by wolves on humans in the past four months in Israel. In most cases, the animals were trying to make off with infants. Wolves are a problem today, and this is the kind of wolf that lives there, and wolves were a problem 2,000 years ago. Along with all those other dangers, there were also a lot of cliffs that the sheep could literally fall over. You can see some of those cliffs uh, here in this picture. And it reminds us of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his namesake. The sheep needed to be led away from the wolves, away from the cliffs, to safe places that they could live. 
And so without a good shepherd, the sheep would die on their own. Uh, one commentary I read said this, to lead a flock through the desolate regions with bandits and hungry animals was a serious business. Being a shepherd was a big responsibility. It took a lot of work to keep the sheep alive. And as we think about this text, you are like those sheep. And just as those sheep had a dangerous life and needed a good shepherd, so do we. Life is very hard. We need a good shepherd. And what this good shepherd does is it leads us to safe places. Uh, I have a picture here of a place called Niagara Falls. I've been there several times. And uh, this one pastor was at Niagara Falls in the winter and he saw pieces of ice floating down the river and then going over the Niagara Falls. Embedded on these pieces of ice were dead fish and eating the dead fish were seagulls. And the seagulls would ride the ice flows down to the falls and then they'd fly away as the ice flow went over the falls. And he watched one seagull on this ice flow and the other seagulls had all flown away but it was sitting there eating the dead fish as it got closer and closer to the falls. And then just as the ice flow with the frozen fish went over the falls, the seagull started to fly, but it was too late. His feet were stuck in ice and the seagull went over the Niagara Falls to its doom. And this is what sin wants to do for you and me. God doesn't want this, but Satan wants us trapped in our sins and end in destruction. And so into this world with so many things against us comes this good shepherd. And what does this good shepherd do for us in our sin? Well, look what Jesus said in Luke 15. Suppose one of you is a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Jesus came to rescue us, lost sheep, from our sin. And so we need a good shepherd to rescue us from our sin and to give us the free gift of eternal life. And John has already talked about this. Very truly, I tell you, said Jesus, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged but is crossed over from death to life. So this is the world we live in, a world where we are sheep in need of a good shepherd because there are people that want to destroy us. And on this weekend at Mount Calvary, we're celebrating the start of the Protestant Reformation. And it is a time when a group of very brave men and women fought against people in power and people with money to bring back to the church the very simple truth, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And on this day, we remember the start of the Protestant Reformation as Luther nailed 95 theses on the church door in Wittenberg. And here is thesis number 62. The true treasure of the church is the most holy gospel of the glory, of the grace of God. You see, there were wolves in the church and Luther with a group of ex-nuns and priests who followed his uh, way of thinking that the Bible is about Jesus sought to bring grace back to the church. They fought against this thing called indulgences, a way to get out of punishment with money. Uh, and again, I talked about it this last week that uh, a, a priest came to Martin Luther's church and was selling indulgences, was saying, as soon as a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. Luther saw this person as a wolf and chased him out of town. And so we continue that tradition 500 years later. We preach faith alone, grace alone, Bible alone. And we see the wolf coming to attack, we chase those wolves away. 
So we need Jesus, our good shepherd, and then good under-shepherds that preach to us the precious word of God. So that is how the text begins. And then Jesus says something about different sheep that are out there, sheep that are different from you and me. He says, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also, and they too will listen to my voice, and there'll be one flock and one shepherd. So who is Jesus talking about here? He's talking about Jews and Gentiles, that Jesus would bring the Gentiles into this Jewish Messiah church, and they would be one. As Paul wrote in Romans 10, there is no distinction between Jews and Gentiles, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call upon him. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, both Jew and Gentile. In Galatians, Paul brought this up again. So in Jesus Christ, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor male nor female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. And so the Jewish believers were called to welcome those different Gentile believers into their church community. And that was a tall order. That was a big change because we were very, very different from each other. And today, we too are to welcome the sheep that Jesus has gathered into his flock called the church. And we need to remember that those new believers, those new sheep are people that Jesus searched for and Jesus has paid for. Reminds me of a, a study back in 1980, this man visited 18 different churches uh, to kind of check them out what they're really like. And he would did the same thing in each one of these 18 churches. He would come in, sit in the front, after church, he would walk slowly to the back of the church and then slowly return to the front of the church and then go out to the foyer by another aisle. And then he would smile and he always dressed neatly and he would ask members to direct him to some place in the building, the fellowship hall, the library, the pastor's office. He always stayed for coffee if it was being served. And he developed a scale to measure the church's friendliness. 10 points if somebody smiled at him. 10 points if somebody greeted him nearby. 100 points if they exchanged names. 200 points if he was invited to come back. 1,000 points if they introduced them to another church member. 2,000 points if they introduced them to the pastor. And of the 11 of the 18 churches he visited, most scored under 100 points. Five of the 18 scored less than 20 points. The new believers, the different ones that Jesus had died for and had brought into the church were not welcomed. And this is what we all need to work on, isn't it? To welcome the new sheep. His conclusion, the doctrine may be biblical, the singing inspirational, the sermons uplifting, but when a visitor finds that no one cares whether he is there or not, he is not likely to come back. So if you wanna do something very, very important for God, if you wanna change somebody's life, welcome the new sheep. Remember those words of Jesus, I was a stranger and you welcomed me and make it your habit before you talk to anybody you know, you talk to somebody you don't know. They might've been a member for years and just happened to show up that day, but talk and welcome the stranger. This is another very important message from this Bible verse. And by the way, the Apostle Paul was not welcomed when he went to church the first time. They all remember that he used to persecute the Christians and then suddenly he becomes one. And this is what the book of Acts says about Paul. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing he really was a disciple. 
But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and told him how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord. And so don't let that fear stop you from welcoming the next little lamb that Jesus went out and got and paid for and has brought to your church family. Again, this is a huge part of being a Christian, welcoming the stranger. And we welcome the stranger because we want them to hear the final point from this text. We want them to hear each week about the sacrificial love of Jesus. And this is what we're finishing up today. The reason my father loves me is I laid down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I laid down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. Jesus willingly laid down his life for us for me and you. Again, the reason my father loves me is I lay down my life. And Jesus didn't have to lay down his life. Uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he could have escaped. But he said, do you think I cannot appeal to my father and he will once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should the scripture be fulfilled that it must be so? Jesus could have walked away, could have been protected by angels, but he did not. When Jesus was being tried by Pontius Pilate, he could have escaped any time he wanted to, but he didn't because of love for us. You see, Jesus seeks lost sheep and pays for their sins with his blood. I like what Martin Luther said. We need to hear the gospel every day because we forget every day. We forget that we were lost sheep that Jesus laid down his life for. And Jesus did this calling us to himself to repent. I like this verse from Ezekiel 33. Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked should turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. For why should you die, O house of Israel? And he calls us to turn each and every day and repent and believe that Jesus is our good shepherd. And what do good shepherds do? Well, Jesus has love and compassion on us. Good shepherds know the names of each and every one of their sheep, and Jesus knows your name. And good shepherds place their body between the sheep and the vicious animals. He will die protecting the sheep. And that's what Jesus did for you. He literally put his body between you and Satan, you and hell, and died for you. And why did he do that? because he is your good shepherd and he loves you. And we're gonna close up with a, a little video from uh, the skit guys that hopefully will remind you of who you are in Jesus. Everywhere you look, everywhere you go, every moment, of every day. From the rise of the dawn to the setting of the sun. From the first cup of coffee to the last bedtime story. At work, in school, among friends, and with your family. During trials and storms, triumphs and victories on your worst day, and in your finest moment. He is near. For our God dwells with us and abides in us. His presence surrounds us, and His Spirit is inescapable. He loves us with an unimaginable affection and cares for us with an unfathomable passion. Everywhere you look, everywhere you go, God is near.
So Jesus is your good shepherd, and he has laid down his life for you, his sheep. And we all need this good shepherd to lead us through the wilderness of this world, to lead us into heaven. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We now stand for our time of prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are our good shepherd and that you willingly lay down your life for us, your sheep, and that you brought together Jews and Gentiles into one flock that are all saved by grace through you. To this we give you praise and glory this day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray once again for those who continue to struggle with life after the floods in the South. Be with those in Florida, in the Carolinas, in Georgia, and Tennessee, and be with the churches that are working there. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We thank you this day for the Protestant Reformation that brought back to the Aryan Church the idea we are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. Help us to faithfully proclaim faith alone, grace alone, and Bible alone. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for those in our church family this day who need your healing touch. Continue to be with Morgan and Cecilia, with Renee and Bruce, with Carol and Tony, with Dave and Lynn and Cheryl. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And we pray, Lord God, your peace and your blessings upon our nation. Uh, be with us as a people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And we want to thank you, Lord God, that you are our good shepherd. And Lord, there are other sheep in our flock that need a prayer right now. So during this time of silence, hear us as we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. So Lord God, we thank you once again for this time of worship and help us to remember your love for us. We ask this in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Parish announcements. Uh, once again, if you want to join me for a Bible study uh, in person here, Wednesdays at 4.30 or you can join me also online. We also have Bible studies on Tuesday nights and on Sunday mornings. Coming up next week is All Saints Day, and this is the day we remember those loved ones who are in heaven. If there's somebody you'd like us to remember on All Saints Day, call the church office, talk to Bob, and send us a picture and their name. And if they uh, passed away the past year, we would love to honor their memories. And finally, I want to thank all of you who support the work here of Mount Calvary Lutheran Church with your gifts and offerings and your prayers. It is time now to go out into the world as God's children to seek the lost and bring them Jesus. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.